Have you ever had a time in your life where you've looked back and you've gone, man, why did I do that? Like, don't tell anybody in here what it was. It's okay. I mean, we're, it's safe space if you want to. But have you ever looked back and gone, like, why did I do that? Like, why did I not just tell the truth? Why did I say yes instead of no? Uh, why did I respond that way instead of a better way? Uh, why did I look at that that I shouldn't have? You know, we, we think about that, we joke and we laugh, and I'm glad you all laughed because that means we're all on the same page here, right? We have moments that we've done that. And, and I'm reminded that if you look at a lot of kind of leadership articles and stuff like that, a lot of people will tell you that every morning when you get up, the greatest threat to ruin your day is looking back at you in the mirror, right? Well, we have a list of all of these things that we want to say are the greatest threats to ruin our day, but ultimately at the end of the day, the greatest threat to ruin your day every single day is always looking straight back at you in the mirror, right? Sometimes it's not what happens to us, but it's the way we respond. It's the decisions that we make. Uh, and today, we're kind of walking through a, a three-part series. We'll take a break next week, but a three-week series in the middle of our The Story, right? So if you're new with us this morning, we've been walking through the whole Bible this year, Genesis to Revelation. Uh, we're calling it The Story. And out of that, it's kind of broken into different sections, right? I like that when you read the Bible, it's not just, uh, it is one story. There's a thread that runs through there, but there's all, uh, often different sections, right? And so we're kind of in the middle of this. Uh, Hampton wrapped us up last week with above all, kind of living above all and everything else for the Lord. Uh, in these next three series, these three messages, there's going to be leadership failure. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some, some prominent people in the scriptures that had some really big leadership failure moments. Uh, and what's fun is I like doing that because when we look at the leadership failure of some of these people in the scriptures, it, it, it helps me resonate a little bit more with them, right? So today we're going to look at Samson. We're also going to look at David, a man after God's own heart who had a huge leadership failure, right? We're also going to look at Saul. We're going to look at a couple of people in the scriptures to go, man, these are the things that are happening in the scriptures that, man, I can resonate with because I can see myself right there with them, right? Because the greatest threat to my day is looking back at me in the mirror, right? And I, I guarantee you, as we look through, you're going to look at Samson, you're going to look at Saul, you're going to look at David, and you're going to think, man, I bet, I wonder if they ever had an uh, opportunity to say something like, why did I do that, <laughs> right? Whatever happened and transpired, I guarantee you, they looked back and went, why did I do that? And the good thing is, is whether you're here as a follower of Jesus, whether you're still processing your thoughts or what I say, kicking your tires about the, uh, the thoughts of Christianity and the claims and the truths of Christianity, um, you're going to study today a, a story that is really kind of more commonly known. It's a story of a man named Samson. Uh, and Samson, uh, sadly, was one of his own greatest faults and failures, right? And, and quite frankly, if I'm, if I'm really being honest, like I see myself in Samson a little bit too much. And it's not just because I'm like real big and strong and, and rip and all that kind of stuff. Whoa, whoa, I don't like the shade being thrown here, right? Uh, you know, we, we do, we always think about this with Samson though, because we think that like he was just this big, strong guy, because that's like the word, but nowhere in the scriptures does it say that he was big, it just says that he was strong. I mean, like power comes in small packages too, don't, don't, don't hate, right? It's okay, don't throw the shade at me, right? Uh, but it's because... Samson kept getting in his own way. Like when you look at the story of Samson, he kept getting in his own way. And quite frankly, there's many days where I get in my own way, right? Why did I do that? Why did I say yes to this thing that I shouldn't have? Why did I say yes instead of no? Why did I spend my time doing this instead of something that I know that I needed to do, right? There's so many opportunities when I look back in the mirror and go, man, I, I was the greatest threat to my own day. See, Samson's problem was not that he didn't have the strength to do what God wanted him to do for the Israelite people. Like, that was not his problem. His problem was that he sab sabotaged himself in his own leadership. Samson really sabotages himself. The problem was that his strength actually led to his destruction. The strengths of Samson led to his destruction. And sometimes as leaders, as people, in our own kind of ways and, and thoughts and what we're doing on our daily basis, our gifts can sometimes become our failures because we lean into them a little bit too much or we don't lean in the, into them like we should. And sometimes our own strengths become our own failures. And that's the problem with Samson. His strength turned into destruction. You see, Samson was actually an answer to prayer, right? Right? He, he was a big answer to prayer for his parents. I mean, it was kind of a miraculous type of birth as well. Uh, and even though he was this answer to prayer, 
And there was this kind of bargain that was made, like, give me this son and I will do this and have a Nazarite vow on him. Samson didn't, lend, uh, didn't in, uh, rise up to his end of the bargain. He didn't complete his end of the bargain like he should have. And uh, the problem is, he really is the story of Israel as well. So for you kind of Bible scholars in the room, if you look at the picture of the Israelite people and you look at the life of Samson, Samson is kind of living out the life of the Israelite people, right? And here's what I mean by that. Uh, Number one, uh, he had this miraculous birth to an older couple, right? And and so the Israelite people, the miraculous birth, if we've been reading along in the stories, that was Abraham and Sarah, right? So they had a child at a very old age, 100, right? I don't know about you, 100 is still an old age to have a child. That's not knocking old age, but I don't want to have a kid at 100. Uh, And so uh, same thing. And so uh, Samson's parents, older in age, and they had this miraculous birth of Samson, right? But then uh, God took something weak and made it strong, right? The Israelite people were very weak. They were under captivity. They were under uh, just the, the guise of the Egyptians. They were weaker people. And what did they do? They grew and they multiplied. They got stronger. Samson, born this weak little child. And what does he do? He grows and becomes strong. Not big, right? Come on, but strong. Then he was separated as a holy and kind of righteous one. He has this Nazarite vow, right? So the Nazarite vow was threefold. He was supposed to never cut his hair, He was supposed to never have anything of the vine. That just meant like alcohol. So he was not supposed to partake in alcohol. And then the other thing was he was never supposed to touch a dead body, right? So this was a Nazarite vow. He was set aside to be separate and more holy because of this Nazarite vow. So I'm not going to cut my hair. I'm not going to have anything of the vine. And I'm not going to touch a dead body, right? And the Israelite people were supposed to be set apart as well. And then last but certainly not least, one of the worst parts is that the Israelite people, if you remember, they're always drawn to these foreign gods, right? So you have God, Yahweh, that they're supposed to be following and walking alongside of, but they don't. They're always drawn to these foreign gods that they kind of lean their life into and they make golden calves and all this other stuff. And then we're going to find out with the story of Samson that Samson also had foreign women, that these prostitutes, or he kind of prostituted himself out. And that's what happens when we have these idols and these other gods is we're prostituting ourselves out to them. Right? And Samson does the same thing in his relationship. There's so much parallel between the Israelite people and Samson in the life of what we're going to find out and walk through today. And I think if we're being honest, if every single one of us in here this morning are being honest, we'd have to admit that more times than not, our life probably looks a little bit too close to Samson's and the Israelites than we would like to admit that we don't have the full-blown trust that we'd like to have, that we don't like to adhere to the things that God wants us to adhere to all of the time, that we have these foreign gods that we want to, or these idols in our life and everything else. And that's because of our kind of big idea today. Our big idea is this. So if you remember and walk out with one thing this morning, I want you to know this. Our greatest leadership failure is failure to lead ourselves. Your greatest leadership failure will always be failure to lead yourself. If we can focus on us, if we can lead ourselves, and it's going to be so much easier to lead the people that God gives us. So do me a favor. If you have a copy of the Bible, turn with me to Judges chapter 14. We're going to be a little bit all over kind of Judges 14, 15, and 16 today in the story of Samson, and you'll find out why, but all of the verses will be on the scriptures. But if you want to follow along in your Bible, take notes and do those things. It'll be in Judges 14, 15, and 16 this morning. Uh, As you're at uh, at that as well, Hampton mentioned it. We have those QR QR codes in front of us. That'll take you to the scriptures. That'll take you to connect cards if you're new with us this morning. Uh, if you want to um, find out all that is going on in the life of Journey Point and what we have going on, you can find that out in those QR codes as well. Uh, Easter invites, social media, all those types of things you can find in those QR codes as well. Let me, do, uh, let me do this. Let's pray and then let's dive in and look at the leadership failures of Samson that maybe apply to our lives today as well. Father, we love you and thank you that um, we can pick up your scriptures thousands of years later and apply them to our life today. Lord, that the story of Samson, um, as fun, as big as it is, as known as it may be to those uh, that are followers of Jesus or even those that are still processing their thoughts, Lord, that we can use the story and the life of Samson that you gave him to our lives today to help us lead ourselves better. Lord, in a world where emotional, spiritual health, self-care and leadership is of prime importance, Lord, I pray that today... God, that you would just reveal to us how we can lead ourselves better into a relationship with you more than anything else that we do. 
God, speak to us through your word. Do it for your name's sake alone. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So let's look at some of the leadership failures of Samson and see what we can learn. And point number one is this. There's three things that I think we can look at from the life of Samson that he failed to do uh, that are probably pertinent to our lives today. And the first one is this. He failed to lead himself. More than anything else, and I mentioned it, I mentioned it with us, but more than anything else, number one, Samson failed to lead himself. He literally has zero impulse control. You know anybody that has like zero impulse control? Like that person that's like, hey, I'm going on a diet. And then you bring over some like cheesecake and they're like just wearing out the cheesecake, right? And you're like, I thought you were on a diet. You're like, yeah, but you brought over cheesecake. And so it's like, we have zero impulse control, right? I'm that guy. Like every time I'm like, man, I'm gonna cut out sugars and desserts. But somebody brought over cookies. I love them. We have a neighbor that makes the best chocolate chip cookies I've ever had in my life. Every time she brings them over, I eat at least three of them in one setting. It doesn't matter what diet I'm on or what I'm trying to do, I'm going to eat them. I have zero impulse control when it comes to our neighbor Danny's cookies, I'm telling you. Um, But Samson has zero impulse control. What we're going to see first, he has zero impulse control in sexual desires first. Very first, this is very prominent with Samson in his life. Look at Judges 14, 1 and 2. So Judges 14, 1 and 2, this is right after the story of the birth of Samson in chapter 13. And when it comes into verse 1 and 2 of chapter 14, it says this, Samson went down to Timnah and saw a young Philistine woman there. He went, back to, uh, he went back and told his father and his mother, I've seen a young Philistine woman in Timnah, now get her for me as a wife, right? So I mean like impulse, he's like, man, okay, I see this woman, I like this woman, now go get this woman, right? There is no thinking through, there is no thought process. The only thought process is I see what I like, I'm going to go and get what I like. We see the same thing if you kind of flip forward just a little bit in, in uh, Judges 16. Says Samson then goes to Gaza where he saw a prostitute and went to bed with her. Again, I see what I like. I'm going after what I like. It doesn't matter if I'm supposed to be doing this or not supposed to be doing this. I'm all in on this situation. And then just three verses later, what do we see in Judges 16 verse 4? Judges 16 4, three verses after uh, his trip down to Gaza, it says sometime later he fell in love with a woman named Delilah. She's a big part in a, a story with Samson that we'll find out in the end. But it says that he falls in love with a woman named Delilah who lived in the Soric Valley. Man, I see what I want. I'm going to get what I want. It doesn't matter if I should be doing it or not. I have zero impulse control. This is what I need. He's failing to lead himself. Impulse control is a problem that we have in America today, right? We have everything at our fingertips. Like we live in the land of the free where we can get anything we want at any time that we want it. And we have zero impulse control to say no to getting it, right? Whether that be men or women addicted to things like pornography or drugs or alcohol or whatever that may be. We have zero impulse control, even though it may be a problem in our life, we're just going to go after it as soon as we can. Because that's the world that we live in and that's the world that people raise us up to be. You do you, you can be anything you want to be, you can do anything you want to do. And so we have this world of zero impulse control, much like Samson. You see, in the same way that Israel wanted other gods and went after them and worshipped them, Samson here sees other women that he wanted, regardless of them being foreign to his people or not, and he goes after them and gets them zero impulse impulse control. But even more, he has this zero impulse control, we find out, to keep his Nazarite vow. Again, this is a special vow. He's been separated from other people to live out. And we find out very quickly that he has zero impulse control to live that out as well. Turn back with me to Judges chapter 14. You see, when he's going after this woman that he shouldn't, the Philistine woman, the foreign woman that he goes after, right, he immediately then begins planning the celebration, right? Hampton got engaged last weekend, and immediately, I think he said by 7 a.m. the next morning, his wife had a wedding planner for him, or his uh, his fiance had a wedding planner, literally. Friday night engaged, Saturday morning I got a wedding planner, right? This is what we do, right? This is the world that we live in, and so I'm going into, and so Samson's kind of doing the same thing here. He's going down to plan this celebration. Now, we know what celebrations look like for weddings, right? There, I mean, it's like we've been waiting on our whole life. Let's do this. He goes after the foreign uh, woman, the Philistine, and he's planning the celebration. And when we pick up in Judges 14, 5, it says this. Samson went down to Timnah. Again, this is where he went to find the foreign woman. With his father and mother, and he came to the vineyard of Timnah. 
Now, here's why this is important. When you study in the scriptures and when you look at commentaries and all of these things, no Nazarite was, was ever going to the vineyards. Why? They made a Nazarite vow not to take anything from the vine. They weren't going to a vineyard to look at the alcohol consumption and the wine and these types of things. And so the very fact that Samson here is going down to the vineyard means I don't care about the vow that I made to God. And I'm just going to go and do my own thing because I have zero impulse control. I'm only going to do what I want, right? This was very rare to see a Nazarite walking into a vineyard. But if you keep reading, the story gets a little bit strange at this point, but it brings up another aspect of the vow that he didn't want to have anything to do with anyway, either. It says he goes down to the vineyards of Timnah, and then suddenly a young lion came roaring at him. Okay, I don't know about you. I'm a little terrified, like just thinking about Samson walking to a vineyard and seeing a lion. But the spirit of the Lord came powerfully on him, it says in verse 6, and he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. Now, here's what I don't understand. How do we know what it's like to tear a young goat? <laughs> like, I love when I'm reading the scriptures, I'm like, as he tore a young goat. Like, I, I don't know, is this the thing that like kids did back then? It's like, hey, we got a couple of young goats. Let's go tear this young goat apart, right? I don't know, man, but like he, he apparently tears a lion apart just like he tears a young goat apart. I still want to know why anybody knows how he tears a young goat apart, right? But he does. He tears this young goat apart. And then it says this, it says, as he tore a young goat, but he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. Again, man, he's not leading himself. He's kind of acting in secrecy here, right? He's keeping things to himself. He's doing things his own way, right? Zero impulse control. I'm going to do it my way. I'm not including anybody else in. And then look at verse eight. After some time, when he returned to marry her, he left the road to see the lion's carcass. Okay, so now he's like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go off and see. Let me see what I did, right? I tore this lion apart. Let me go and take a look. And there was a swarm of bees with honey in the carcass. Again, have no idea why. I don't know if that's a thing. Like, do bees just attract to carcasses and put their honey in there? But this does. And so what does he do? He scooped some honey into his hands and ate it as he went along. When he came to his father and mother, he gave some of it to them and they ate it, but he did not tell them that he had scooped the honey from the lion's carcass. Nazarite vow number one, don't cut your hair. We'll talk about that in a minute. Nazarite vow number two, no alcohol. He went to the vineyard. Nazarite vow number three, don't touch a dead body. What does he do? Zero impulse control. He's not supposed to be doing these things. He is not leading himself. I mean, he's throwing a keg party for the wedding. He's walking along, killing lions like he kills young goats. He's touching dead bodies, and he is doing what he wants to do. Now, here's where it gets a little bit interesting. This is not the last time that he touches a dead carcass, okay? Fast forward with me to chapter 15. In chapter 15, um, what happens is he, he kind of has a riddle uh, with this lion's carcass. We'll talk about that in a minute. He goes through, some Philistines come through again. He's kind of boasting in what he did with killing this lion, right? Like, I'm not going to lie. If I killed a lion, I'm probably boasting about it too. Like, I'm going to walk out like puffed up chest and be like, hey, guess what I did today? Killed a lion. How about you? How was your day, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm posting on Facebook, Instagram, and all this kind of stuff. But he's sitting around with some Philistines. He's telling this riddle. He does all that. What happens is, fast forward, some situations happen with his wife and the father-in-law. Um, he loses out on this riddle. And again, we'll talk about that in a minute. But then he goes, and, and because he gets mad at these Philistines as he's talking around, they begin to do something that's wrong, and they end up killing his wife and the father-in-law. So he gets mad. Obviously, he's going to take vengeance. He's going to take things into his own hands. And what does he do? And chapter 15, verse uh, 16 is kind of where we'll be. I'll start in verse 14. It says to this, when he came to Lehi, the Philistines came to meet him shouting, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully on him and the ropes that were on his arms and wristbands came like burn flax and fell off. So here's what had happened. He had had some foxes. He tied the foxes' tails together, burned their tails, and then sent them across the yard. It's kind of like a playful joke. Again, don't know who's joking and who's doing what, but like, I like Samson's head, right? This is like practical joke one-on-one. Sends them across, he does this, they capture him, they take him in, right? And so it says they fell off. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, reached out his hand, took it, and killed a thousand men with it. Dead carcass, jawbone of a donkey, takes it, kills a thousand men with a jawbone of a donkey. 
Now, this is where it gets a little bit weird, but I love it. It says, then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, I've piled them in heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I've killed a thousand men. When he finished speaking, he threw the jawbone and named that place Ramath Lehi. Like, here's what I'm imagining. Like, he takes this jawbone as he, as he uh, just picks it up, right? Again, breaking the Nazarite vow, kills a thousand men, composes his own song in front of them, right? He's like, you know what? I'll get up. With the jawbone of a donkey, I've killed a thousand men. With the jawbone of a donkey, I've piled them in heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I've killed a thousand men. Then he drops the jawbone like a mic and just steps back, right? Like, here I am. And I'm like, dude, this guy is crazy. He's impulsive, He has zero impulse control. Is it okay for him to act vindictive in this type of way just because of what he is walking through? No, but because it feels right for him, he's just doing as he pleases, breaking Nazarite vows, killing men left and right, and just being kind of goofy and fun about it, right? Piece of me thinks of like, just like, younger frat guys in college, right? Like this is, I think of a strong guy in college that's just like, I'm gonna do whatever I want to. And this is who Samson is. He doesn't even care that he's acting petty and vindictive at all because he's not leading himself. He's failing to do the things that are very simple and known that he needed to do as a Nazarite. Like as a follower of God, As a committed Nazarite in this vow that his parents and he had made, he's failing to do the simple things. In church, we do the same thing. We know the things that we're supposed to do, but we sometimes act petty and vindictive. We sometimes fail to lead ourselves. We sometimes act in ways that we justify in our own mind because we think they're right. And when we're doing that, we are failing to lead ourselves. And maybe it's just even as simple as like, you know, we talk about the 5% life in here. Like, I don't know all of the things that you are supposed to be doing, but I know one way that you can lead your life as a follower of Jesus would be this, live the 5% life. Like give 1% of your day committed to prayer and scripture, right? 15 minutes of your day committed to spending time with God. Give 1% of your week and gather time, just like we have right here. Like be committed to that. Give 1% of your month and group time gathering with other people walking through the same things that you are walking through. That's six to seven hours a month. Give 1% of your quarter to growing in how God has wired you and gifted you and led you, right? That's grow time and intentional leadership development. And give 1% of your year serving locally, nationally, and internationally on missions. Like, that's how you can lead yourself. Like, that's a really good baseline starting point, right? Like, for Samson, it was to, like, not cut my hair, not to take anything from the vine, and not to touch a dead body, but he couldn't even do that. And I think we, too, can see ourselves in the same way. When we consistently kind of go, man, this thing is more valuable to me, and I want to do it more, so I'm going to lead myself to do it. And so what we're doing there is we're failing to lead ourselves, So he's failing to lead himself, but I think another failure that we see with him is that he's failing to listen to other people, right? If you go back to chapter 14, when he meets his first Philistine woman, in verse 3, right after verses 1 and 2, it says, he went down to Timnah and saw a young Philistine woman there, went back, told his father and mother, I've seen a young Philistine woman, now get her for me. Listen to what mom and dad say. Mom and dad said, but his father and mother said to him, can't you find a young woman among your relatives or among our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines for a wife? They're telling him, hey, this is not a wise choice, Samson. This is not the decision that you need to run into. This is not the decision that you need to make. This is not a wise decision for what it is that you are walking through. But do you notice that Samson, like, doesn't care? And it's because he's failing to listen to wise counsel. As a matter of fact, in a lot of these stories that we see about Samson, you will see him by himself. As we read about the lion, right? He, he's by himself, goes off the road by himself, and goes and then touches the dead carcass. When he's making the decision about Gaza and the prostitute, he's by himself. Delilah, by himself. The Philistine woman here, by himself. Do you know that the enemy wants you in isolation? Like as we read through the scriptures, we don't see that God says, I want you in isolation. We need to spend time with God, but God never says, you know, you need to go and isolate yourself and never take wise counsel from anybody else. 
As a matter of fact, if you read the scriptures, it's just the opposite, that you should seek wise counsel, that you should be in community with the one another's that we see in scripture over and over and over again. But man, Samson is living in isolation and that is just where the enemy wants him. Because when we separate ourselves and put ourselves in isolation, then we can begin to make our own decisions and it makes sense to us. And yeah, I'm going to do it this way. And I can be petty and vindictive because I deserve better because it's all about me. But did you know that when you have friends around you, they remind you that it's not all about you? That it's about living life with one another? For those that are married in the room, it's not all about you. For those that have kids in the room, it's not all about you. For those that are single in your workplaces, it's not all about you. No matter where we are in our life, it's never all about us. It's about living life and community with other followers of Jesus. That's why we do things like connect groups here, right? We're trying to get you connected into the life of other people. And here's why. When you get connected to other people, you know what you find out? You realize that other people are going through the same thing that you're going through. Right, because in isolation, you feel like, man, I'm going through, I'm alone. Nobody else is going through what I'm going through. My life is terrible. It's hard. But when you get in community with other people, you find out, oh, yes, we've struggled in this area too. Yeah, our marriage is hurt in this way too. Yes, I'm struggling in my job with those same thoughts and feelings. Yeah, I'm struggling with my neighbors in that same type of way. When we get in community with one another, we find out that we're not isolated and alone and have a story that's all to ourselves. We find out that other people are going through it, and those other people are going through it to help us walk alongside the same thing. I cannot encourage you enough. If you give us one hour a week, if you're only going to give us one hour a week, I'd rather you do it in groups than come into here, because that's where you're going to get connected to the life of other people that are walking through. As a matter of fact, we're, we're going to start kind of a quasi group tonight. Uh, I'm going to be leading a thing called Unique, helping you find and discover your life calling, like how God's wired you to live out inside of your vocation. 6 p.m. for the next six weeks. We'll take off next weekend with Easter, but we'll be right in here, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. You'll really enjoy it. We have about 10 people that are coming right now already. Would love to have you here walking through that as well. Just connecting with other people more than anything else. You see, God doesn't change us through isolation. By the way, let me just like side note, we live in a world where we have instant information with anything we want, right? If I'm walking through something, I can find a podcast to help me walk through that thing, right? If I want to walk through something, I can Google it and find the answer on Wikipedia or something else. Like I can look at all of these things. So it promotes me living in isolation, Quite frankly, like online church is a good thing. I'm glad that we have it so that we can have people that are traveling or immunocompromised and all that, that are watching online, they can do it. But you know what is better than watching messages and engaging in podcasts around the world with the top of the top and all of the other categories that we live in from all the experts? Talking to people face-to-face, looking them eyeball to eyeball. Like we can sit back and we can go, man, I'm going to watch this and I think it'll be okay. I'm going to watch, I'll just watch this message and I'll feel good and that'll get my, my church feel. No, it won't because nothing we see in scripture is about isolation and watching something like that. It's about doing life together with one another. Like we've got to be a people that engage. We live in the third loneliest city in America. DC is number one, Vegas is number two, Denver is number three. What if we change that? Like, what if followers of Jesus said, you know what? We're going to take this seriously. We're going to invite people in. We're going to connect with other people. And we're going to reduce the percentage of loneliness that means that there's counseling, that means that there's depression and anxiety and suicides in our city. Like, they should not be there. And we're going to start doing it out of this place right here because we're going to connect with other people. Like, what if it changed right here because we took a stand to say, this is the vow that I'm going to make. Because I'm going to listen to other people and not be like a guy like Samson who failed to listen to others because he didn't have others around him. But not only that, he didn't lead himself, he didn't listen to others. Lastly, he failed to learn from his mistakes. Like he failed completely to learn from some of his mistakes. Anybody say like I've made a mistake more than once, right? Okay, yeah. Shame on you guys, man. I was just kidding. If you didn't raise your hand, you just don't like raising your hand in public, right? All of us have made the same mistake over and over again, and Samson did the same thing. Okay, so like I told you, that he's got this lion's carcass, right? And he creates this riddle because he's proud. He's got Philistine people around. He's like, I'll have some fun with this. He creates this riddle in chapter 14, verses 14 through 18, and it says this. 
It says, he's got them around. Tell us your riddle, they replied. Let's hear it, okay? So Samson, kind of proud, I just imagine with his chest poked out, right? He's like, so he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. Figure that out, right? It says, after three days, they were unable to explain the riddle. And then on verse 15, it says, on the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, persuade your husband to explain the riddle to us, or we will burn you and your father's family to death. Yikes. <laughs> like, wow. So, like, what started as fun and games, man, just got serious really quickly. It says, did you invite us here to rob us? Because what was on the line was 30 garments, right? If you get the riddle, I'll give you 30 garments, but if you don't, you have to give me 30 garments is what it says back in verse 13. And so Samson's wife came to him weeping and said, you hate me and you don't love me. You told my people the riddle, but you haven't explained it to me. Look, he said, I haven't even explained it to my father or mother, which like, does he really care? I mean, he doesn't even listen to mom and dad anyways. What makes us think that he would tell them that? It says, why should I tell it to you? She wept the whole seven days of the feast, and at last, on the seventh day, he explained it to her because she had nagged him so much. Not going there. She then explained it to her people. On the seventh day before sunset, the men of the city said to him, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? So he said to them, if you haven't plowed with my young cow, not going there, you wouldn't know my riddle now, right? Samson is just, he's off the walls. And then in verse 19 and 20, I know this is not up here. It says, and the spirit of the Lord came powerfully on him. He went down to Ascalon and killed 30 of their men. He stripped them and gave their clothes to those who explained the riddle. In a rage, Samson returned to his father's house and his wife was given to one of the men who had accompanied him. This is right before they end up killing them with the foxes in their tails, right? So surely Samson would learn from this in terms of giving away secrets that he didn't want to be given away to his wives, right? This wife ends up dying. He goes into Gaza with a prostitute. Then he meets Delilah. And Delilah is, she's also this kind of, just to quote the scriptures, this nagging wife. Because what happens is he comes in, and if you look at chapter 16, verses 16 through 20, he's not told anybody the power behind his hair being grown out, that the strength that he has is because he has not cut his hair. And so these Philistines are constantly trying to figure out, how is this dude so strong? He's never told anyone. But Delilah keeps pestering, keeps trying to find out. The Philistines are trying to get the, her to figure it out, right? He lies a couple of times and finds out that it wasn't the right thing, right? He makes up a couple of things. And then in chapter 16, verse 16, it says, because she nagged him, again, scriptures, not Chris, day after day and pleaded with him until she wore him out, he told her the whole truth and said to her, my hair has never been cut because I'm a Nazarite to God from birth. If I am shaved, my strength will leave me, and I will become weak and be like any other man. When Delilah realized that, she had told, that he had told her the whole truth, she sent a message to the Philistine leaders, come one more time, for he has told me the whole truth. The Philistine uh, told me the whole truth. The Philistine leaders came to her and brought the silver with them. They bribed her. It says, then she let him fall asleep on her lap and called a man to shave off the seven braids on his hair. On his head. In this way, she made him helpless, and his strength left him. And then one of the saddest verses in all of Scripture. Then she cried, Samson, the Philistines are here. When he awoke from his sleep, he said, I will escape as I did before and shake myself free. And here's the sad part. But he did not know the Lord had left him. Caught up in his own demise not leading himself, not listening to others, and here not learning from his own mistakes, Samson didn't even realize that the Lord had left him. And church, this is the trajectory of us caught up in our own sin. No matter what small thing we may think that we are doing, no matter what small thing that we think that we can get away with, no matter how petty or vindictive we think that we can be, no matter what post that we can make that's just a little bit of a nudge here or whatever it is, caught up in the trajectory of our own sin is we don't realize that the Lord can leave us. The Spirit of the Lord cannot be leading us in those ways. And that's what happens with the sin in our life. Like when we are doing things in our own way against the way that God wants us to do them, 
we don't even realize how caught up and entrapped we get. And so Samson loses his strength. The spirit of the Lord leaves him. His greatest leadership failure is failure to lead himself. Church, I promise you, our greatest leadership failure is our failure to lead ourselves. But the story doesn't end that way. You see, because no matter the failure, failure that you have, no matter what you are caught up in, you are always able to cry out to God. And he is always faithful to listen. You are always, no matter the failure that you have going on, you are able to cry out to God and he is always faithful to listen. Judges 16, 22, it says this, they, they entrap him, they gouge his eyes out. Like he's entrapped, he's tied up, he has no strength He's in an area where all the Philistines are gathered around him, right? All of them are looking. We finally got this dude who took the jawbone of a donkey and piled them in heaps, right? Who killed 30 men, who took the foxes, who took the garments, who's stronger than any of us. We've got him. And they're in this big facility where all the leaders and all the people are gathered, and he is tied up to these pillars. No eyes, he can't see. And then verse 22 says this. But his hair began to go back after it had been shaved. Do you know that you have fresh new mercies every single morning? Like no matter where you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been or where you think you're going, like you have fresh new mercies from God every single morning. Just like these kind of fresh new follicles that are growing and regaining his strength just a little bit, like you have fresh new mercies from God. And then Samson kind of realizes this, and in verse 28, it says this. In verse 28, he says, Lord God, please remember me. Please remember me. Strengthen me, God, just once more. He says, with one act of vengeance, let me pay back the Philistines for my two eyes. Samson's tied to these pillars. He then tears both of these pillars down because God regains his strength. And it says in the scriptures that in his death in doing that, he killed more Philistines than he did when he was alive. And it is the perfect reminder of the restoration we have because of the grace of God. And next week is the pinnacle of followers of Jesus in knowing that. Because next week is the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That means that no matter how petty, how vindictive, how wrong, how many things you've done your own way, how many times you've failed to lead yourself, how many times you've failed to listen to others, how many times you haven't learned from your own mistakes, no matter what you've done or where you've been or where you even think that you are going, God was faithful to send his son, Jesus. That no matter where you were in that, all you have to do is ask for forgiveness of your sins. He's faithful to forgive. And if you believe in his death and his burial and his resurrection, then you have eternal life with him. Like that's a reason to celebrate, church. Like that's something that like when we look at our leadership failures that we can hold down on ourselves more times than we want to, like we can look at it and go, okay, but God, please hear me. Please strengthen me. Please restore me. God, do a work that only you can do because clearly we know that I can't do it myself. And that's what God is asking us to do. He's asking us to realize the life, death, burial, and resurrection of his son, Jesus, and put our hope and our faith and our trust and our everything in him. And so as Hunter and the team get ready to come back up here, the one thing that we have to ask ourselves more than anything else, because listen, I, I'm with it here with you. And I know the answer to this, right? We, we have failure upon failure. I'd say it like this often. Like, I feel like a follower of Jesus is kind of like a Hall of Fame baseball player where you fail or strike out seven out of 10 times and you're a Hall of Famer, right? Because if you bat 300, you're automatically going into the Hall of Fame. And like living the life of a Jesus follower feels a lot like failing after failing after failing after failing. But God is so faithful and just to forgive with his grace and his compassion and his mercy. So a lot of times we look back and say, man, what do I need to do? And so here's the question that I want you to walk out of here with today. Like the, the one question, in what way do you need to lead yourself better? 
The best thing that you can do for your wife right now is to find out how you can lead yourself better. The best thing that you can do for your husband right now is to find out how to lead yourself better. The best thing that you can do for your kids right now is to find out how to lead yourself better. The best thing that you can do for your family or your coworkers or your friends, or if you don't have a wife, a husband or kids or family or coworkers, for your neighbors, for the people around you, the best thing that you can do right now is to find out how can you lead yourself better. I can promise you this. One answer that I'll give you is to be committed to the life of a Jesus follower. I promise you that 5% that we talked about earlier, if you just do that 5%, the other 95% of your life will be forever changed. I promise you that. Like if it was a money back guarantee, like, like Hampton was talking about in, in announcements this morning, like I could give you a money back guarantee, like the guy that's on all of the shows, that if you will give your life to the 5% life of a Jesus follower, the other 95% will be changed because you'll be leading yourself. You'll be listening to other people that are in your life and you'll learn from your mistakes. And so for the next 30 seconds, I just want you to pray and ask God. One, give me the strength to do it. Two, reveal to me how I can lead myself better. Father, failure is tough. And we've all been there. And today I just want to acknowledge that I'm grateful to read the stories of men and women in the scriptures. God, that you've given these, these stories too. That even in the life that you've given them and the story that you had unfold, like part of that was us seeing their failures. But I'm also grateful that even in the midst of their failures, you did not say, I'm done with you. You did not cast them aside to say, you cannot be used. Father, and I know in this room right now, sometimes we feel like we cannot be used. God, but we can. We have fresh new mercies every morning. God, we have the ability to cry out and say, God, strengthen me, use me, do what you desire to do with me in my life. So Father, I pray right now that anybody that is sitting right here thinking they cannot be used, I pray that you would encourage them. God, that you would just give them that, that kind of gentle nudge, Lord, that they can be used, that you are not done with them. Father, and I pray that if, if anyone is here this morning and maybe they have been processing their thoughts about Christianity, maybe they're watching online, God, that you would let them know that no matter the failure that they have, no matter if they think that they can't own up, Lord, that you would guide and guard and lead them into a relationship with you. Father, that if they believe in your son's death, his burial and his resurrection, God, if they place their faith in that, if they ask you to forgive, you are faithful to do it. If they say yes to you leading their life, God, then they have a relationship with you forever in heaven. God, and that today would be the start of a new day for them. Today is the day of salvation. Father, that you would use them mightily. God, we pray that you would use us. I'm so blown away by the fact that you desire to use me in any kind of way. God, but in spite of me, you decide to use me. So thank you for that hope and that truth. Lord, do the work that only you can. We love you and we praise you, and it's in your name. Amen. Hey, if you for the first time, I've said yes to following Jesus as we just kind of prayed. I would love for you to do this. Text this number, 720-780-6969. And if you'll just text, I said yes with no spaces there, man, that, that gets you into community. That keeps you from being isolated. Man, text that. We want to do nothing more than to walk alongside of you and let you know our struggles as well. And also, if you have never followed through, by showing and kind of publicly declaring like, hey, I've never been baptized on the right side of saying yes as a follower of Jesus. 
or maybe I've never been baptized at all. Like the scriptures command us, once we become followers of Jesus, even Jesus himself was baptized, right? And we would love nothing more than to walk through for you to kind of publicly proclaim, hey, I said yes. I've said this before. It's like my wedding ring. It doesn't change anything there, but like, you know, I'm married right now because you know who I am. But this sign for those people that don't know who I am says, I'm taken. I'm Libby's. Baptism is the same thing. It says, I've said yes to following Jesus and I want you to hold me accountable to it. And so we'd love nothing more than to follow through. You can indicate that on that as well. Do me a favor. Let's stand up. Let's worship one more time before we close out for the day.